three, two, one, roll the footage. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Simon Severino, your host. And today, my guest is the founder and CEO of Agritecture. He helps others navigate the crucial planning stage for their urban farming business and avoid costly mistakes. Agritecture has grown to be the world's leading advisory firm on urban and controlled environment agriculture. Welcome, everybody. Henry Gordon Smith. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. So cool to have you here. You are on tour right now. Tell us, where are you? Oops, you froze the fun, the fun of live TV. Oh, you're back, Henry. So tell us about your tour right now. Yeah, I'm currently in Muscat, Oman, and I'm doing a tour all across the GCC in the Middle East, something I do every winter. Um, you know, it's because there's a lot of opportunities here for growing indoors and a lot of events as well. And I like to visit the farm. So I got to go to Qatar. I was in the United Arab Emirates. And uh, on Wednesday, I head over to Saudi Arabia. And you are not just hanging out there. You are on the big stages and doing consultancies with really relevant people. And so on those big stages, what do they ask you to talk about? Well, I think one of the things that makes agriculture unique is we're not promoting one way of doing this. We work across the sector from government to cities, to corporations, to entrepreneurs. And so we have to really be adept at understanding all the different types of agriculture as much as possible to advise our clients on their options. So when events ask me to speak, they want really two things. One is for me to bring the international context, what is happening elsewhere and applying it to the local region where the event is happening. But then also what's the landscape of possibilities and options, right? Not just promoting, hey, everybody should build greenhouses or vertical farms are the best thing in the world, but instead of trying to give people methodologies to think about the different options they have and how to make the right choice for them in their business. Is the world running out of food? Well, actually we have enough food to feed everyone. That's what's really sad is we've got enough food to feed everyone. It's just not distributed properly and it's not accessible by everyone. So we have about 1 billion people who are overweight or obese, so they have way too much food. And then we have 1 billion people who are going hungry. But in fact, there is enough food globally for everyone. Now, again, the quality of that, the access of that is quite different. And there's a variety of reasons why food is lost in the distribution chain or at the site of production or just aspects of the cost of food or the lack of quality of food that's affecting nutrition. So it's not so much a problem of, again, volume. It's more about location and distribution. And sort of one of the things that we're trying to work on is localizing agriculture closer to where the consumer is. Because by distributing agriculture as opposed to having it centralized in a place we import that food from, we can actually start to impact and disrupt some of those key problems around distribution and thus improve food security overall. In 20 years, how will be growing food? Well, because of climate change, we are facing ongoing challenges to produce food, right? The, the places that typically have the right climate to grow food are at threat. We're seeing things like increased CO2 in the atmosphere, which is causing decline of nutritional value in wheat and soy. We're seeing things like droughts that are affecting all kinds of products where there used to be abundant rain, now there isn't. So what's gonna have to happen is we're gonna have to learn to grow more with less resources. So agriculture has typically been based upon an abundance of natural resources, where now we have to sort of take a step back and say, how can we design the systems? How can we optimize the farming systems to use the minimum amount of land, water, and other inputs? Now, in addition to climate change in the longer term, we have short-term challenges like the Ukraine war that Russia has initiated, but also we have crises like the pandemic, and we'll have more supply chain issues that will remind us of the fragility of the system and a need to invest in what has historically been an underinvested sector and an under technology implemented sector. We, I'm in Vienna and we have an event tonight in Vienna where Sadhguru is also on tour uh, with Safe Soil and we'll be talking soil and, and what to do about that. Now, do you think, will we get soil back on track or do we have to work around with other solutions where you can skip soil completely like urban 
urban farming or other kind of um, techniques? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the work we do relates to hydroponic greenhouse and vertical farms. We also do work with soil a bit. And, and obviously the high tech forms of agriculture that agriculture often engages in because they're popular are partially popular because they don't require any soil. So we can just build farms and then let nature do its own thing to restore itself. This is sort of called rewilding. Now, I agree with that statement and I agree with that argument, but it's still relatively minor. The bottom line is that if we really want to improve agriculture and improve our ecosystems, we do have to focus more on soil. We have to focus on restoring it. We have to focus on encouraging regenerative methods. The problem is that our population is very large and the demands of consumers throughout the year, no matter where they are for any kind of product is so high, it's hard to find a real solution where globally we can move to regenerative agriculture and restore the soil. So I think it's going to have to be a mix of solutions and those solutions should be context based, right? Because not all of these systems make sense in every region. So it's really about, again, not a one size fits all solution and encouraging more young people to get involved in agriculture, more investors to look at agriculture, more policies to encourage different methods of agriculture, not just one. But absolutely, we have to focus on the soil as well as focusing on new technologies that don't need soil. When did you start agritecture? Well, I, I was a young college student. And I had a professor, uh, he was talking about water wars. And I was like, what are water wars? And these are sort of these battles between countries over natural resources, specifically water. And I sort of like learned that there's really a lot to unpack there. And there's a lot of things that I didn't know. And many people don't know about resource scarcity and how it derives political instability. I mean, even a lot of what's happening in Ukraine could be associated with uh, resource grabs as well. So anyway, long story short, I started looking for solutions and I found urban agriculture as a solution that I thought was very underestimated, very undercommunicated. And I thought that this was going to be a really popular thing in the future. So I started blogging about it. I just started visiting farms and researching projects and giving sort of my take, my analysis, sometimes controversial, sometimes agreeing with them, sometimes disagreeing with them. But in the end, I created this sort of digital community that people came to to find the latest news about urban agriculture. And this was before the first vertical farms were really built and commercialized. So it became a destination that people would go to to learn about these cutting edge technologies and companies. And it became a really thriving ecosystem and digital community that is something I was very passionate about, but sort of evolved into the services company that agriculture is now. You hang out right now with the coolest people on the coolest events. So I want to hear um, one, two highlights from there. And especially who do you pick for the strategy award after one word from our sponsors? What if your business would run well even when you are on vacation? Discover how 1,600 business owners have regained their freedom using the Strategy Sprint's blueprints. How they enjoy living their dream and watching their business scale. Get the exact checklists they use to go from stressed to fulfilled using the Strategy Sprints method. Order your copy of Strategy Sprints 12 Ways to Accelerate Growth for an Agile Business on Amazon today. And if you love it, leave us a review. For more information, head over to strategysprints.com. When everybody zigs, this person zags. But from your perspective, they're doing the right thing. Who do you pick? I definitely would nominate Christine Gould, who's the CEO of Thought for Food Foundation. She's definitely zigging around. You know, she is so out of the box in every single thing that she does. She doesn't approach anything conventionally. And, you know, one of their mottos is uprooting the status quo. And I think in an era of like a lot of conventional agriculture, Christine brings a fresh and dynamic aspect to it. And just to give you some specifics, you know, she brings like youth together and older people together and corporations and policymakers. And she creates these amazing events and challenges related to food and agriculture. But then she spices it up with art and dance parties and live DJs and food tasting. So she makes it really fun and engaging and just very unconventional in a very you know boring set of events. She mixes it up. And so she's definitely on her own pathway and an inspiration to me and many, many others. Sounds amazing. Thanks for sharing. And um, where do you take your inspiration from? Are there specific podcasts, books, people that inspire you? 
Yeah, I mean, I think my first uh, person that really inspires me is my mom. She was a successful consultant and came back to Czech, Czech Republic after um, communism ended and sort of created a really strong brand around HR, emotional intelligence and diversity in the workplace. And so as a young teenager, she taught me a lot. And as I launched my business, she really mentored me a lot. So just a very strong, you know, entrepreneur and businesswoman and, and really good understanding of people, which is one of the most critical lessons I learned of running a business is that your people are your most valuable asset. So she's a she's a huge inspiration to me in particular. But I would say, you know, some other people that are inspiring to me, Christine Gould is definitely on that list. I would say Rob Lang, one of our clients and CEO of Farm One, who's created a most incredible brand and business around vertical farming is, is very inspiring to me as well. There's a lot. There's a lot of architects, a lot of policymakers that also inspire me. Long, long list. Are there some newsletters or podcasts about vertical farming that you can point our audience to? Well, of course, Agritecture is still the most popular and engaged blog in controlled environment agriculture. We have an active newsletter where all of our social media, whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever you want, Instagram, if you like more of the visuals. And we're even developing some shorts for YouTube and our YouTube channel is growing as well. So there's really like all kinds of content. It's hard for me to promote another one than us because we produce the most free and accurate content for controlled environment agriculture out there. But I also like the Modern Acre podcast. There's two guys that have done a really successful podcast about agriculture in general that I think is a really, really good one. Um, otherwise, I listen to the Daily for the New York Times every single day for my news, but that's not necessarily an entrepreneur or ag one. Um, but I really like that one as well. And I would say Ag Funder, if you're looking for the investment angle of ag tech, Ag Funder is by far the best. A really, really awesome, awesome uh, source for news. Agritecture.com, everybody. And uh, so what, what's next? You are still on tour. What's, what's exciting for you looking at the next six months? Look, we've, we, we've built a successful consulting business and that evolved from a blog. And that was sort of like chapter one was the blog and chapter two is the consulting business. And now as an entrepreneur, I'm trying to think about what's next. How can I push to the next level? How can I scale up my impact? And so with my team, we conceived of this idea of taking farm planning online. Imagine every single step of doing your education, your market research, developing your brand, designing your farm, doing your economic modeling and searching for suppliers. Imagine it all online. And that's Agritecture Designer, which is what we're investing heavily in with time and resources. And this is the first farm planning software of its kind. So now you can literally take any agricultural idea, starting with greenhouse and vertical farms, go through the main crops and run scenarios for what it might cost you, what you might grow, what kind of jobs you might create, you know, how long it, it would take to do it. And all of this you can do online. So it's sort of like a Swiss army knife for planning your farm. And it disrupts even what we're doing on consulting, right? It creates another pathway for people to learn and to get the data and to do this effectively, but in a more modern digital way, which I think is very important to set the foundation for the next 20, 50 years of agriculture. How far is it? that will have farms run by robots, robots inputting everything in one database, which is on a blockchain, having a smart contract that operates when they sell it, at which price, at which variation, what happens back, what they reinvest. So basically, when will we have a food growing out automated system in every city which produces locally, and uh, affordable and fresh for everybody? Well, you know, I think that um, if you think about food, it's different from manufacturing, right? And so we look at the Amazon warehouses and they are semi-automated, but not fully automated yet. And those products are not necessarily all perishable. In a farm, you need to have a bio, it's biological plant, the growing, you need to take care of them in different ways. And there's ways to automate that, but I think we're still quite a ways away from that. I think there are automated vertical farms that already exist, but again, they only produce sort of leafy greens. There's automated tomato farms and greenhouses that are starting to get built. There's robots that can harvest and pick that. So I would say fully automated, I don't know, maybe for some simple crops like microgreens and leafy greens, I would say we're probably in the next five years before that's completely possible. But I would say for a wider variety of crops, you're really looking at another 10 to 20 years, but it is accelerating very quickly. I mean, it's been very interesting to see how quickly the sector has advanced. 
and robotics and all of these exponential technologies, you know, they're exponential for a reason. They learn from themselves. AI is involved in it. Big data is involved in it. Sensors are talking to each other and it just really accelerates the, the pace at which it can develop. Now, the capital cost for these systems is higher. So I'm skeptical as to whether this is going to feed all of us, but there certainly will be farms like this in major cities, I would say, in the next 10 years. Because that's pretty soon, right? 10 years. Because many people listening, they go, oh, yeah, yeah, it will be, but like in 50 years. 10 years is pretty soon. What are you seeing in terms of, yeah, in terms of problems in adoption or, or topics where, where people should, should look to? Because most people here listening, they run small businesses. Um, topics for adoption in agriculture or, or what, what do you mean? Do yeah, you in, see- in your field related to automation and AI and robotics. Yeah, I think there's a lot of work being done into sort of operating systems for the farms. That space is getting a little bit crowded, but there's still great opportunities there. But I think that there's really exciting opportunities around distribution, you know, connecting the farms to the buyers, I think is still quite a big gap. Um, Things like inventory management, uh, rating the quality of the products so you can optimize that more effectively or other consumables is important. Um, We also are working a little bit more on looking to the future, right? How can governments and cities use big data to think about food security. And this is some, like, somewhere that agriculture sees opportunity in, in making an impact on. I would say also just like, you know, labor management and labor education. Um, there's a lot of new talent needed for the space. So there's ways to use technology and AI to help in that regard as well. And of course, robotics. I mean, robotics is still just getting started in agriculture. So there's huge, huge opportunities to optimize that process and the various software solutions needed to make that effective and, and profitable. Nice. And so when when your tour ends, what's what what happens then? Well, listen, my tour never ends because I'm a nomad. So I, I, I don't have an apartment. I just travel constantly. So I'm going from, from Oman, I'm going to Jeddah, then to Cairo, then to London, then to Prague, then to Amsterdam, then to New York. And so it, it's just a constant thing. I usually have about three months in advance planned, and then we'll see where I go from there. But I will say that I haven't been to Asia recently in a long time. So I, I would like to go there, and I'm planning a big trip across South Korea, Malaysia, Japan, Hong Kong, and um, other parts of Asia, the Philippines maybe. So that'll be, I think, a long six-month trip that I'm working on. And then I'm starting to get really passionate about Africa as well. We started to have our first consulting deals even there. And there's sort of an emergence of technology as a solution for some of those food security challenges. So that's also very interesting to me. And I I hope to explore Africa in the next two years as well. Cool. Next stages where we can expect you and maybe even publicly watch you? Yeah. So the next big event that I'll be at where I'm moderating the main vision stage uh, um, in addition to participating with my team, is at Green Tech, which is happening in June, and that's in Amsterdam. And those dates, I think, are June twelfth, uh, maybe June fourteenth, actually. Sorry, June fourteenth, and that's a huge event. June fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen. That is just the biggest horticulture technology event. So if you want to see all the robots in action, if you want to see the software solutions, if you want to see all the main companies, that is the place to go. And you know, it's always a great time in Amsterdam and, and a really big event. After that, I'll be in New York again in June, around June 23rd for the Indoor Ag Tech Summit. And I'll be speaking at that event as well, which will be very exciting. And those are the main ones coming up soon. I literally just finished about eight eight events. So I'm taking a little bit of a break before the next one come up, but really hope to see you at them. You can find all of the industry events at agritecture.com slash events. We update it weekly and we keep them up to date so you know which ones we endorse, which ones are high quality. Henry Gordon Smith, everybody, agritecture.com. And which socials do you do you prefer? Where do you hang out? Yeah, if you want to follow me on my personal Instagram at the Agritect, like architect, but Agritect, you can find me there and follow my adventures. But at Agritecture has all the latest from our company, including cool projects, cool reports, data, and different farm tours as well. So depending on what you're interested in, you can find me on those places. And I'm very active on LinkedIn. If you want to follow me there and see my articles and all my posts, that's another great place to stay in touch with me on a professional level. Super cool. And um, who should be my next guest, Henry? Well, I mean, I was thinking about this and I think that, you know, I'm trying to encourage more uh, women 
in agriculture. And so Miney Prins, who is the CEO of Priva, which is a relatively older company in the Netherlands, but is really across the sector in ag tech um, and buildings as well. They do smart buildings. So I thought it'd be interesting to talk about that as well. So she's incredible, uh, voted you know entrepreneur of the year in the Netherlands and is just a dynamo of, of really speaking about the subject and her experience as a CEO. So I nominate Miney Prince of Priva. That's beautiful. Henry Gordon Smith and uh, his Instagram, I just found it, the Agritect everybody. Thank you so much, Henry, for being here, sharing this amazing um, world that you are immersed in and that you are building with us. Please keep rolling, man. Thanks for having me. Take care, everyone. Hey, if you love what you are hearing, you will love our free masterclasses. Go grab them at strategiesprints.com. What if your business would run well even when you are on vacation? Discover how 1,600 business owners have regained their freedom using the Strategy Sprints blueprints. How they enjoy living their dream and watching their business scale. Get the exact checklists they use to go from stressed to fulfilled using the Strategy Sprints method. Order your copy of Strategy Sprints 12 Ways to Accelerate Growth for an Agile Business on Amazon today. And if you love it, leave us a review. For more information, head over to strategiesprints.com.